This morning it is a great joy and privilege to introduce to you Wiley Peterson. If you are at all familiar with bull riding, you've heard the name Wiley Peterson, one of the most respected names in bull riding. Been to the Grand Championship dozens of times, and uh, this is a, a, one of the most respected men in the entire PBR. Wiley, come up here, will you, buddy, and uh, let us welcome you this morning. Welcome you, guys. Well, I'm, uh, I'm from Idaho. <laughs> it's a long way from here. <laughs> it's a long walk. Uh, you know, I got, I got saved when I was about 12, and the way that happened was I, basically I just wanted to know how I could get to heaven, because I didn't want to go to hell. So I, you know, I asked my mom, and she, uh, she wasn't really a Christian, but she knew somebody who was, so. Uh, she went and asked that lady, and the lady said, well, you just have to ask Jesus in your heart, and you go to heaven. Well, uh, well that's easy enough. So I asked Jesus into my heart every night. <laughs> I thought he got out, I guess, but <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't, you know, that was about it. I just, I, I believed in God, and that's kind of, that's as far as my relationship went with God, and, and I saw churches, you know, you go and listen to some boring guy talk about what you should do and what you shouldn't do, and it just, it was kind of stale and boring to me, and I just, I, I did everything I could to avoid church, basically. Um, so, but if you would have asked me, are you a Christian, I would have said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a Christian. There was no evidence in my life whatsoever. Um, so this was, you know, this went on for about six years, you know, growing up. You know, kids, you know everything, so you don't really need anybody to tell you what, tell you how to, how to do things. So, um, just kind of growing up, going through high school and, and that, and bull riding, you know, bull riding was my, was my God, I, I would say. Um, everything I did revolved around riding bulls, and I got, so I get to about 18 years old, and I just, know that something's missing you know I, I I still don't feel like I I really know for sure that I would go to heaven and, and you as a bull rider bull riding makes you face death <laughs> you've got to be comfortable with dying if you're gonna ride bulls <laughs> so I was struggling with that I, you know I I didn't want to die yet <laughs> so um, I just kind of again struggling and kind of getting with the wrong the wrong crowd and kind of heading down the wrong road. I knew that wasn't right. I knew that wasn't going to help me, and I uh, I ended up getting <laughs> kind of getting in trouble. I disobeyed my mom and and uh, fairly serious. And so her punishment was that I had to go to church. <laughs> I'm like all right, I'll go to church. I guess it's better than getting grounded. So I said, all right, you know, I'll go to church with you. She, she just started going to this church. and So I, I go, and, and that, that day I just, I was blown away by, by what I seen. I saw people who were passionately in love with God, and it, it freaked me out a little bit, I'll be honest, because they were raising their hands, and there were people crying, and, and I'm like, I was looking at the pastor like, what is he doing to these people, you know? He's, he's got some sort of spell on them or something, you know? And then it was time, you know, the worship was over and, and the pastor said, you know, hey, take a minute and greet each other. And man, it turned into like a, a huge hug fest. <laughs> so I got all these people, all these strangers coming at me like, you know, and I was like, whoa. But it overwhelmed me just seeing the relation, you know, the relationship and the, and the passion that these people had for God. I knew that that was real. To me, that was, it was evident that that was there was the living God in the in the present in their presence, you know. And from that day on, I said, "That's that's where I need to be. That's what I need to know. What these people have is what I want." And I committed my life to God at age I would say 18. I, so I asked Jesus in my heart at age 12, but I really committed my life to God at age 18. And from then on, I there was this hunger in me to know God more. And I really appreciate the fact that at that church, the pastor, he was, he was very big on the Word of God and the Spirit of God working 
hand in hand, working together. So he really impacted me and, and explained to me the importance of the Word of God, of knowing the Word of God. Because it, before that, I didn't, I didn't read the Bible. I didn't have a Bible. I didn't even, I didn't even know where to start in the Bible. I thought the Bible was something that the pastor was supposed to read and tell us what it said. And I started to get into the Word of God and really had a reverence and a respect for the Word of God. It's the Word of God. I mean, that's it is God's Word written down on paper for us to study and know and meditate. And I wanted to know. I'm, I'm, when people come up to me and they say, "What you know? What happened to you? What are you? What are you? You know? What are you religious now?" I could explain. No, no, no. It's not religion. I don't like religion. I'm in a relationship, and I could explain to them the hope why I had hope because I was studying the Word of God. And that's, I think that's so crucial for us as Christians is that we have to realize just how important the Word of God is in our life. We take it so casual because, I mean, there's probably dozens, hundreds of Bibles just laying around. And we, you know, in other countries, the Bible is something you have to hide. You have to... You have to smuggle it in, and if you get caught with it, it's like being caught with illegal substance. You know, it's 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 that crucial for them. For us, it's so common that we don't take it as the word of God, and we have to get back to that. And there are days when I open my Bible, you know, and I'll just kind of read, and honestly, I'm just reading, and I don't even remember what I just read. <laughs> and there, and I have to go, and I have to pray. I say, Lord. This is your word. You know, before you open the word, just ask God, Father, speak to me right now because I know this is your word. Really make that, make it a, uh, an important thing in your life and realize how important that word of God is because there are people who have lived and died so that we can have our Bibles. And the word of God, if we, you know, the Bible, in the Bible it says the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two, any, any two-edged sword, able to, able to divide. You know, I, in my mind, it's able to cut out cancer, right? It's the way I kind of look at it. We have cancer in us, and the Word of God is able to, with precision, is able to cut that stuff out. And it, it helps us to realize what it is in our lives that are keeping us from God's best. And being really keeping us from being a blessing to other people. And if we can realize just how important the Word of God is in our life, and really ask the, ask the Lord to speak to us, you know, as we read, speak to me and show me what it is that I need to know in this in this particular part of the Bible or or whatever it is. He will. It's amazing how he will speak in right where you're at. You know, you can read the Bible hundreds of times through and you read it again and something will catch you and it'll just speak to you and it'll change your life and that you know i heard a lot i've heard it said that as a christian we sometimes or all the time we are sometimes the only bible that most people will ever read and if we don't know the word of god there's no way that we can live it out so and you know my encouragement is for myself and for you is to get back to having that reverence for the Word of God. Don't just get in the Word of God when you're when you're at service on Sunday. Don't expect the pastor to tell you what the Word of God says. Get in the Word of God and ask God to speak to you as you read it. And really make that time. Set everything else aside. All your problems and all your cares and all your distractions. Set it aside and really focus on meditating. You know, meditating in the in the Bible, it just means you're chewing it. You know, it's like a cow chewing chewing its cud. You chew on that stuff and you take it in and you say, all right, what is this saying to me? Father, what are you saying to me right now? What do you want me to do? How am I treating, how am I treating my wife? How am I treating my husband? How am I treating my neighbor? You know, am I, am I being the person that you've asked me to be? Am I living up to this? Because what did Jesus say about the Word of God? He said, you don't know me unless you obey me, right? You don't, you know of me, but you don't know me unless you're really obeying what I say. And that's, 
the true test. But how can we know what He says unless we get in the Word of God and we pray about it too? Because His Holy Spirit speaks to us. God is speaking to us all the time. You know, His written Word is written down. That never changes. But His His words that He speaks to us as we read, that's what that's what we have to kind of lead. You know, like that, that's what guides us through the paths of life that. Um, you know, we never know what's going to happen, and, and but the Word of God is our is our is our solid foundation. We can stand on that. So I just want to encourage you guys to have that mindset that I need to I need to get in the Word of God. It is crucial for me to know God's Word, to read it, and to really make that your you know put that on high. That that's the Word of God. That's the most important thing that you'll ever have in your hand is the Word of God. So. With that, I want to have Todd, Todd Pierce. He's our, he's our pastor. He's the chaplain of the PBR. And he's, he's been instrumental for every one of us bull riders on tour because we're gone every weekend riding bulls, and there's a lot of temptations in the world of bull riding. And he kind of helps keep us. He discipleship. He disciples us. And he keeps us grounded, and he keeps us moving forward. And he... He uh, challenges us to step out of our comfort zone. This is not comfortable for me to do, but he, you know, he pushes us and he encourages us to get out there and share the word of God and and share God's love with people. And so this guy right here, he's he's got a good, an awesome word for us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Todd. Man, I like this setting. Uh, I don't get to listen to music like that very much, and uh, it, it's just pretty special to me, especially to be here in the Sale Barn and, and uh, see my, my kind of peeps and uh, know that uh, we're all here probably for the same reason. Uh, I've heard it three times, and I've only been in this building an hour, is that we're really just about loving God and loving people. And if we can keep it that simple, uh, then I think God really does do some pretty amazing things. And to me to have, uh, I actually pulled up at 8 o'clock this morning and there's all these cars here. I'm thinking, what in the world's going on at 8 o'clock? There's like a half hour until church starts and there's people here drinking coffee and eating donuts and loving each other. And uh, So good on you. I'm, I'm happy to see this is going on. Uh, we get to travel all around the world and meet uh, the family, believers everywhere. And it's neat to see the unity that we really do have because of Jesus. It's He's what makes us unified. We all look a little different. We, you guys talk really different, <laughs> but we're all centered on the on the same uh, living God, and that's Jesus. And so, uh, I love what Wiley spoke on. Um, I think what do they say? You, you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. You teach a man to fish, he drinks all day. <laughs> I saw that on a shirt. I thought that was cute. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's great for us to be able to come here and get in a place. And I understand that Scotty is just a great Bible teacher, and he's just about as real as they come. <laughs> I consider that God's gift to you. Amen. But just like every gift, um, there there comes some somewhat of a temptation in that gift. And that is that you come here Sunday mornings and you allow Scotty to keep spoon feeding you. And uh, what Wiley has challenged you on and me on again is that that isn't what our father's intent was. He he did give teachers, he gave pastors, he gave all sorts of different giftings to build you guys up so that you can go and do the work of the ministry. But he never wanted us to bypass that us having to go to him and hear from him directly. Amen. And I'm glad that I can pick up my phone and I can call my sons and I can say, son, did you notice that, that growl, you know, top rail was knocked off. I noticed when I was leaving this morning, would you get that, that fixed? I don't want to have to call my secretary to go tell my son what, you know what I'm saying? Because as a father, I, I don't just want to give him instructions, but I could relay that through somebody else. Okay, John, go do this. But there's other things that he's got to hear from me. And there's things that you have got to hear from God as a father. Straight to you, not through Scotty. You need to be in your personal time, in his word, hearing what he has to say. 
about who you are, who he is, and what his plan is. Because as simple as it sounds that we can love God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind, and then love others as ourselves, that's not so simple. Just love God and love people. Simple, simple, right? It ain't that simple because I have a hard time loving some people. And if I say it's simple and and I actually hold myself to the standard that God has set for me, um, we as a group of writers have been looking in the, the book of First John and, and, and just being challenged by some of the words in there. And, and he says that if, if, if we say we love God but we don't love people, then we're a liar. Amen. And, and so I, I look at us as a church family and, and me as an individual and, and so many other people in my lives and, and they're struggling intensely in relationships. And even the people that they say they love, they, they're not showing love towards those people. And so I'm going to give you just a couple nuggets of, of truth that, um, that maybe you can apply to. If this is really what we're charged to do is just love people, then what is it that's making it so difficult for us to do that? And how much time do we got? Are we good until they start beating the door down to get in for the next service? Um, before, I, before I go into that, I just remembered something. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, had learning disabilities most of my life and uh, couldn't read well. Really, really bad student. And, uh, and so I always thought that I was um, kind of, I got the a pass on having to, to study God's Word. I know how to read, it's just hard for me, and it's work for me. And, um, and so what I'm telling you, I think there's people here that are saying, you know, I just don't understand it when I read it. Why? It doesn't make any sense to me. That's why I come and listen to Scotty, because he helps it make sense to me, and that's great. That is God's gift to you to have that teacher. But I've got a friend, he's one of my closest friends, and he's got my learning disabilities on steroids. Like, his ability to read um, was even less than mine, substantially. And um, he gave me a Bible a couple of years ago. Man, this dude was marked up. And I know what it would have taken for him to spend that much time in that word, in those kind of passages, trying to process, and how many times he'd have to read it over to say, God, I know you've got something here. I know you're trying to say something. I don't get it. I'll read it again. And I'll read it again. And I'll pray through it. And I'll say, Father, what is it that you've got to say to me through this? Because when you're coming from a position of being um, desperate, our Father, is he, he loves us to come to Him hungry. Yes. And I don't know how you feel this morning and how everything is. I, I love having a good time, but... Um, but there are certain times when it's just like God lets us stop for a second. He wants to tell you something. And, and the way you're going to hear it is if you are actually hungry. If you, if you have ears to hear, then hear this. And so if there is somebody in your life, hopefully not some other relationship that someone else is struggling with, a relationship that you're struggling with, I want to just give you one, one nugget of truth and know that, that this is going to be for those who have ears to hear it. And uh, I bet there's at least one of you here that can. And Jesus was just uh, adamant about the truth. He said that the lies are what the enemy has done. If you want to um, destroy somebody, all you've got to do is deceive them. And so if I can tell you a lie, and you know I'm lying to you, no harm, no foul, right? But when I tell you a lie and you don't know that I'm lying to you and you believe me, now you've become deceived. And see, we didn't do this thing with our kids, but I know a lot of parents do. Um, you know, you, you tell them about the Easter Bunny, they're on. You got a bunch of kids in here, probably. Huh? <laughs> uh -oh. I'm going to the cab, I'm going to get stoned. <laughs> I can pretty much tell my kids at a certain age anything I want and they're going to believe me. Okay? That's a pretty dangerous power to have over somebody. Amen. Especially when I'm communicating things that I don't even mean to communicate. As in, um, 
son, you're not powerful, I'm powerful, and I'm going to control you. And what I've communicated to him, he's never even going to question it because that's just how he was taught to be. Is that now when he gets into a relationship that he wants to have some power in, he's going to decide it's my job to control this person and I'm going to use my power to control them. And so what... If you've got a Bible and you've got 1 John chapter 4, and I was talking with a friend of mine last night, and she's got a dad that is. Anybody seen Cars? You know the animated yeah. film? And there's the there's the hippie Volkswagen bus on there that is always smoking weed, I think is what they kind of insinuate. <laughs> Smoking weed was always talking about the love, man. It's just all about the love. And, and you know, you got the peace sign on the Volkswagen bus and all that sort of thing. This gal's dad's just like that. She said, this sounds like him because in the first in First John chapter 4, um, he talks just a whole bunch about what love is. And in verse 17, he said, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love. I don't care if you hear anything else that's been said this morning. But if you can, you can say there is no fear in love, and you get that today, then you're going to ask yourself, and why is there so much fear in my life? And why is there so much fear in my relationship? And why are so many people around me in their relationship struggling with fear? It's the absence of love. And it's what we don't understand, how we've been deceived into how we relate to other people. This, this is going to be a whole lot simpler, so stick with me. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. How many know that um, I'm not a great theologian? But a, a, a friend of mine made it really simple for me. He said this, if you want to know what perfect theology is, look at Jesus. Because Jesus was God incarnate. His life becomes, if you want to see what God is like, read the Gospels. You want to know the heart and the character of God, look at the life of Jesus and look at how he interacted with people. And my favorite story that's going to illustrate to you why it is that, that this love overcomes all fear and how we try to control each other by external means. It, it's kind of like with my wife and I. We know how to do it. You know, it's, we've been together 20 years or so. And I know how to get my way. <laughs> and unfortunately, she knows how to get her way. And it's in some ways manipulation, in some ways you know, guilt and, and um, anger or I'm going to withhold this or I'm going to do this if. And it's embarrassing to have to stand here and tell you that because I'm the pastor and I'm the guy that knows the Bible and I'm supposed to have her all figured out, but I don't. And, and so since we're all here and we're all real, the fact of the matter is, is that when I read God's Word and I'm, and I'm trying to find out more about what He says about me, I don't need to look any further than, than how much I actually do love my wife and, I'm, and how desperately I'm trying to figure out how to do it better. Because I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to control her. I don't want to make her life feel like it's, it's being uh, restrained. Because Jesus said this was his goal in life, is he is going to come and he's going to make people free. He's going to make you free from the judgment of sin. He's going to make you free from the guilt of sin. He's going to make you free to have any fear. You know, I, I mentor bull riders. You think if there's anybody that's fearless on the planet, some said they're either fearless or they're stupid, and I said they're both. <laughs> but uh, they're not afraid of certain things. But fear has its way of showing up in a lot of different ways. And so we have got to understand the perfect love of God in order for us to ever be able to conquer fear. So if we've got fear in our lives, fear says that there's an absence of love. And so I'm going to just tell one story to, to give you kind of a, a, a starting place here because 
My and Wiley's conversation this morning is that we really want to leave here with you, giving you guys the ability to fish. We want you guys to learn how to go to God's Word and why it is that we're not just reading historical facts that are stories about what God used to do. These are, this is historical facts that have the, has the Spirit of God on them that are speaking to you and enabling you to do the exact same thing now that God did back then. That the same God that rose Lazarus from the dead is still active and moving and living in us Amen. and wanting to do the same thing around us. Now, I've never laid hands on a dead person had him come back yet. <laughs> it's going to be really cool if it ever happens. But, <laughs> um, but I actually believe that it, that it can happen. I'm just one of those kind of guys that just because I don't know it's never happened, it doesn't mean I'm not going to keep asking. I usually don't ask out loud because... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, so there was a whole bunch of religious people. Anybody like religious people? So you know what I'm talking about. All right. Because sometimes I say that in some circles and they're like, me? I like that. My relig I'm, religious people are this. It's people that want to use some sort of method to obtain favor with God. That's what every religion in the world is trying to do. Is if I do this, 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 and this, then God's going to be okay with me. All right? This is, this is the kingdom. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that God did this, this, and this because that made us right. This is... It's backwards. It's, it's the kingdom came to earth and revealed and is revealing sons of, of, of God. Okay? And... And so we're not going to do a religious thing, but what religion tried to do is it said, okay, I'm going to give you the rules and I'm going to control you with the rules. And if you don't keep the rules, then I'm going to kill you or I'm going to shame you or I'm going to make you feel guilty. That's what religion does. It doesn't work. It might make compliant people. It might get you to be a good boy or a good girl, but it doesn't make free people. And Jesus said, I want you to be free. I want you to be free to govern yourself. I want you to be free to have an indwelling of the Spirit to where I'm making choices to line up with what God's word is so that I really can love my wife. So I really can love my kids. So I don't have to feel like I have to be... I, I need to control the people around me. And so religion has been doing this for a long, long time. And so when Jesus comes onto the scene, it was an epidemic. Because now religion was controlling the government and it had so much influence that people were literally... Um, I don't know, I read stories of how black people were treated and how controlling and hateful and mean certain groups would be to them. And, and I just don't go for that. I don't know if you're racist here or not, but I just don't go for that. Amen. That, that is not kingdom. That is hate. That is evil. It is demonic. Okay? And so, hope you don't mind that, but that's the truth. And, and so... But the religious people back then were doing that to, to people the same way. It was the same spirit. It was an evil spirit. And so Jesus is, is standing in a public place, and they drag a woman to him. And she'd been caught in the sack with some guy. And it wasn't her husband. And so they drug her through the streets, shaming her, and threw her at Jesus' feet. And said, this woman was caught. We caught her. And she was in the sack with this guy, and the law says that anybody caught doing this is supposed to be stoned to death. And Jesus did not argue with them. He didn't say, challenge the rules. He didn't play, use fire with fire. He didn't try to use fear to overcome them, which I think he could have, actually. He just said, you're right. This is what it says. So those of you that are without sin, I want you to cast the first stone. It's my favorite story in the Bible because um, I've known what it's like to have religious people accuse me and show hate towards me. And I've heard the word of God in the middle of it. And so when I read that story, that's not about a woman 2,000 years ago. That's about um, the reality that that same God that was Jesus is living and active. And he is speaking into my life. And when all the accusations come and all the fear and all the control from out, outward sources is trying to make me feel shame because of a mistake I made, I know it was wrong. I know I shouldn't have done it. 
I know I don't ever want to do it again. And when all the voices are coming in that are wanting to shame me, make me feel guilty and stupid, that's when I need to hear the words of Jesus. Where are all your accusers? Which one of those people that are accusing you are without sin? None of them. And Jesus looked at her and says, neither do I condemn you. Now he gave her some loving instruction. This wasn't a controlling God. I think God could control me if He wanted to. But He don't want to control me. That's right. Okay? He wants, he wants me to be able to control myself. It's part of the fruits of His Spirit. And Jesus said, now go sin no more. It's a liberating thing. And it's going to liberate you in your marriage. It's going to liberate you in your relationship with your kids when you just say these words. I can't control you. I can't change you. And if you put off the inevitable, you're, you're either going to stay married because you're stuck, or, like my parents, after 40-something years, get a divorce. Your kids are going to find out that you can't control them, and they're not ever have been able to practice controlling themselves. Wives, you can't be the Holy Spirit in your husband's life. Husbands, you can't control your wife. You can't change her. And when we create an atmosphere of love the way Jesus did, and we, and we learn, and we, we go to the book, and we find out exactly what God was talking about, pertaining you and the way you love, and the way we actually can be free, then you can start making those adjustments in your relationships to where, okay, this isn't something we just talk about on Sundays and we hope for. We actually do learn to love people. We learn to succeed in our relationships. And impossible things start happening. Relationships that were dead on the vine, when you start injecting some truth into it, they begin to flourish again. We've got to get rid of fear. We've got to get rid of whatever it is that we're trying to do to control people and look to the author and the finisher of our faith and realize that if we are to love the way God loved, we need to realize that that came with no strings attached. It was not a controlling God. And when Jesus fulfilled the new covenant, He says, I have fulfilled the law. I've kept all of this. Now I'm going to show you how to put this in practice, what love looks like. Is that too tough? Okay. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. I want everybody in this room to leave this place today free. And it's going to require a few things. First of all, if you're to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, which is the first thing we've got to do, Amen. you need to realize that you need to respond to His love. He has loved you unconditionally. Your sin is what has separated you from Him. It's your rebellion. You're not a victim. It's not someone else's fault. You can't blame anybody else. You are powerful. You're powerful because of the choices you made. And if you're willing to acknowledge that and say, God, I'm sorry for rebelling against you and I, I want to receive your love into my life. Teach me to love people this way. Then it can all start with you today. And I know that there's plenty of people in this room that would love to pray for you. They would love to stand in agreement with you and say that, you know what, today's the day that you're going to turn a corner. You're not going to live your life like a victim blaming what's wrong with your life on somebody else. You're going to realize that you're powerful and that God is going to meet you right here. But then those of you that are Christians, I want to be the guy that just keeps cheering you on and saying, come on, troops. And we are the family of God. We are the Bible that other people are reading, like Wiley said. We are the ones that are supposed to show the world what love looks like. And he says that they're going to know that you're my followers by the way you love each other. That's the evidence of a follower of Christ. 
But if you're anything like me, you believed some stuff when you were a kid that you didn't realize was wrong. And it was how to relate to people. And that love doesn't mean that I'm going to control them. And so if, if we can just get that far today and challenge yourself to say that, okay, obviously I've got some work to do here. I was, I was uh, modeled some things as a young child on how to relate to people. And I've actually never really questioned them. And you're living out those stories you were told. I won't bring up the fairy tales anymore. But you never questioned them in the most crucial parts of your life. And that's why you're struggling so much with these relationships. It's because you're still practicing the things that you were told that were wrong. And this is a love letter written to you. Amen. And every bit of it reveals the heart of God. Amen. And when you are finally convinced of how much God loves you and His plans, <coughs> then when you go to the book and you read the book, this is all about, Father, I need you to show me more about who you are and who I am Amen. so that I can love people better. And it's in every page. It's in there. You've just got to come to it willing to eat it. Um, I'm going to let uh, Wiley close for, for us. And then uh, I think you guys got songs and stuff too. But man, I like being here. And uh, I know we got another service coming. So we can't just hang out all day. But uh, keep going, man. And the fact that you're here already sets you apart from the masses. Because you're here because you, you really do want to uh, become... Uh, a more uh, faithful follower of Jesus. You do want to learn to love people better. So, uh, congratulations. kind of talk about a little bit about who we are. We're uh, Riding High Ministries and this, this ministry was started oh probably 10 years ago, 15 years ago uh, at the PBRs. Um, just the need for rider discipleship, church services for bull riders. We started opening up, uh, the services up to the, to the public and we are continuing to grow and we just love it if you guys would consider supporting our ministry Mainly prayer. We we definitely need a lot of prayer. You know, we're trying a bunch of bull riders trying to tell people about Jesus. So that's that's supernatural right there. But we just we would love it if you'd consider uh, supporting our ministry financially and and through prayer. Um, you can go to ridinghighministries.org to to learn more about what we're doing in the in the country and in in other countries. So there's a lot going on there, and um, we just love to hear your comments and. Uh, I get to visit with you on the way out, and with that, if you don't mind, I'd like to say just a real quick prayer over you, and 